Hey buddies, uh, Neil Ciceriga here. I am Lemon Demon, the musician who made Spirit Phone this album. This is a commentary track for an album, which is weird. It's hard to talk and listen at the same time, so after a few failed attempts, I ended up uh, writing a lot of notes. So sometimes, if I sound like I know what I'm saying, it's because I'm reading from a script. And other times, uh, I'll sound... Uh, like, you know, what's the word? Bad. So, Spirit Phone began as soon as my last album, View Monster, came out, which was 2008. And it came out 2016. I still put out music in the intervening years, but they were just short EPs and sample-based mashup albums. This was a long-in-the-works return to a full-length original music album. And there were multiple times when I thought I had this thing in the bag and I was always telling people like, yeah, it's going to come out this year. It's going to come out next year. It's almost done. And, you know, all these tracks were almost quote unquote 90% done no matter how much I messed with them. But eventually I figured it out. So to rewind a bit, this album starts off with uh, some white noise some soft white noise some spooky sounds. And then the music begins. The white noise returns throughout the album a few times. What does it mean? It's a ghost. That's what it means. This track is called Lifetime Achievement Award. I picked that title late in production. I didn't feel like any of the lines from the actual chorus of the song worked as a title. Uh, some early versions I think were named Experiments in the Revival, which is a reference to Experiments in the Revival of Organisms, a 1940s Soviet medical film where they supposedly kept a severed dog's head alive with science. I've never actually watched this clip because it just sounds really disturbing, although it's possibly fake, but I'm glad I didn't go with that title because it's maybe too freaky a reference right out of the gate. Nonetheless, I've got this whole song about creepy scientists reviving dead musicians, reviving them straight into new contracts like performing animals. Uh, this song idea goes back to 2012, when there was that whole, I guess, scandal about the hologram version of Tupac. Remember that? I barely remember that, but... Anyway, the early 2010s is where this song was born, and the references to Michael Jackson's death and to Katy Perry sort of date it, but not too badly, because Katy Perry is still doing her thing, and Michael Jackson's still dead. The chorus uses, in addition to me screaming a uh, computer voice, it's actually... Not a, not a real one, but it's an emulated Atari speech synthesis uh, program. And those things are so bad at pronouncing things. I had to break up the words into individual syllables just so it wouldn't be cemetery instead of cemetery. Uh, an earlier version of this song was a totally different recording that I, I just worked on it too long and it just started to sound bad to me. So I scrapped almost everything and I recreated it from scratch. And I listened to it recently, and this always happens, but I was like, oh, this is kind of better in some ways. And that's just ugh, really aggravating. But that version was missing a few important chunks, I, I think. And starting over made it easier to kind of insert uh, a few extra bars here and there to spread out the lyrics a little bit. And this uh, pretty cool keyboard solo wasn't in that version. So it was worth it, I think. But of course, all my friends who I would send early versions of this song to uh, when they heard the, the new version, they did not like it as much. That always seems to happen. In fact, it happened uh, publicly because I put out an early version of Reaganomics later on this album, and people got used to listening to that version. And then I changed a bunch of stuff, and a lot of people did not like it as much. Now, one solution to this is for me not to take eight years to make an album and uh, don't feel guilty about not putting out enough content and end up releasing songs early in an unfinished state so people can just know that I'm not dead and I'm actually working on music. But now I'm not even talking about this song, so let me, let me stop myself right there. Actually, the only note that I missed is uh, earlier when I said uh, you're unnatural, babe, which is a pun on you're a natural, you're unnatural. Originally, that was just, you're unstoppable, babe. So I got a bad pun in there. That's one thing I improved over the original. Cool. 
most of my songs, there's just one tempo that's locked in, but uh, for this I tried to add little moments where it slows down or give a drum fill a little room to breathe, and that helps it make it feel like a more alive song. So this part is, it's my voice going through a really deep synthesizer vocoder effect, and I am paraphrasing the disclaimer that shows up at the beginning of the uh, the video for Thriller, where Michael Jackson, I guess, um, had a crisis of conscience and uh, just had to make sure that everyone knows that uh, he's not a practitioner of magic or whatever. So uh, I just took that phrase because it's, it's pretty well worded and I kind of turned it into a, a Pledge of Allegiance type call and response thing with some robots. And for some reason with the robot voice, the word record just sounded not robotic. I had to say record, record. Making this little acapella intro involved like four or five different vocal tracks. And some of them are doing, you know, like the main chords. Bah, 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 bah. But then there's one track that's doing all the uh, in-between notes. And that one sounds really funny on its own. It's just me going, ba 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 ba. I've got a fake string quartet going in this song that uh, to my ear sounds pretty good. I've always found that strings are one of the hardest instruments to make sound realistic using just a computer. But I found a pretty good sound library that is sadly discontinued now. So this song is about a dedicated caller into a radio show who has it all figured out and he just needs to explain it to someone and even just knowing how he's going to sound to other people is giving him all this anxiety and it's coming out before he can even say what he wants to say in fact it never comes out so this song is just a big rant of preemptive defensiveness and saying you're going to do something without ever doing it and i i named dropped robert stack and leonard nimoy who uh, hosted respectively Unsolved Mysteries and In Search Of, which were both shows that uh, dealt with bizarre and often paranormal stories and tales. Uh, and I actually love to read about UFOs and paranormal stuff, even though I'm not a real believer. When I was a kid, it was just a really fun thing to, to, uh, to stretch my imagination with, I guess. Uh, on my Patreon, I posted an early, early ancestor of this song called Ivanushka, which was uh, based on uh, the movie Jack Frost, which was a Mystery Science Theater episode. And that song had a lot of different sounding parts, but one of them was the uh, basically the chorus of this song, only I was singing about Father Mushroom and Ivanushka. And that happens all the time in my process. I will find melodies in songs, unfinished songs from years and years ago, and uh, since they're mine and I've never done anything with them, I'm free to basically plagiarize myself. And a lot of the time, these melodies will just kind of stay in my head for years, and that's how they'll end up getting reused. And I'll be going through old files, and then I'll realize, oh, I actually did record this melody a long time ago, and I totally forgot. But the flip side of that is, discovering something like that can be a little depressing because it reminds me, oh man, I take so long to finish music. Writing this little rap here was great because I got to use a lot of little, um, just like phrases and stems that I had written in a, uh, in a big text file that I always wanted to use, like the word ufology or name dropping ancient aliens. I actually just paused and checked my old uh, lyrics.txt file and yeah, I totally wrote uh, Species of Big Cat, I am Robert Stack, UFology, Demonology, all like in this little paragraph. So I guess that's where this song came from. Uh, and the Super Sargasso Sea that I mentioned was a sort of thought experiment by Charles Fort, who was a very interesting early cataloger of, catalogist of the paranormal or seemingly impossible stories. Look him up. The song always makes me think of once when I was a kid, me and my dad were just messing around with a touch-tone telephone and trying to play music on it. And I think we were trying to play Shave and a Haircut and we must have played the first three notes and then hung up. Uh, and those first three notes happened to be 911 because 
a cop showed up at our door a little while later saying like, hey, we got a call and someone just hung up. So I imagine my dad probably tried to explain what happened and the cop must have been just like, uh, okay, please don't do that. As this album was starting to come together and I was starting to get excited and see it as not just a collection of songs, but it's an experience, man. I, I started extending the outros for songs and making these kind of uh, swirling synthesizer soundscapes. And I had to shorten this one because it was just too much. But I've always really liked the effect of a song kind of decompressing and getting you ready for the next track and not knowing exactly where the cutoff point is. So this is Cabinet Man, an upbeat song about a supernatural serial killer. This is supposed to be the kind of ludicrous story that would show up in an old horror anthology like Creepshow uh, with lots of creative gore and vivid lights. I don't really remember what inspired me to write this kind of story. There is the urban legend of Polybius, a uh, weird 80s arcade game that made people sick and lose their minds and die, but the body horror element where a guy somehow medically transplants, you know, all his systems into a video game cabinet. Uh, not sure what I was doing when I came up with that one. Uh, there is real guitar in this, but the like the underlying rhythm guitar is fake because I tried playing it myself and I got really bad hand cramps trying to keep up that rhythm. There's also backup vocals that are filtered through a plugin called Bitspeak, which uh, makes vocals sound like a speaking spell. I also used it on uh, Melt Everyone from from Mouth Sounds on Rob Thomas's voice from the song Smooth. I've also got a lot of uh, really fast hi-hat hits here, which I definitely did not play IRL. A lot of these songs use little synth uh, instruments that have a random element to them. They'll play, you know, a note an octave up or an octave down uh, in a total random fashion. Um, and that is built into the plugin. It's not how I'm playing it. Uh, which is good, it adds some variety to the sound, but the drawback is every single time I play the song, it sounds a little bit different. And that's true anytime I export the song as well. So if I ever needed to go back and, you know, remix or reconstruct the song from the original files, uh, it would end up having a lot of little variations from the original. One of the bonus tracks on Spirit Phone is like a more chill version of this song from 2009. Doesn't have any uh, any lyrics. It's long before I thought of uh, putting body parts in a video game cabinet. I remember some early lyrics being about a seesaw. I guess my content has changed a bit over the years. I reversed the drums in this part, which is something I forgot you could do. I'm glad I did it. And of course, you can't be a monster arcade cabinet without immediately having to reckon with uh, becoming obsolete in the face of home consoles and portable consoles. This guy is pretty much doomed to just be thrown away or end up living in uh, some enthusiast's collection. Maybe be in a, like a movie theater lobby. When I played this song live years ago, I made a backup video or like a backing projected video that was uh, clips from a well, a 80s anthology movie about an evil arcade game called The Bishop of Battle, I think. It's from a movie called Nightmares with Emilio Estevez. It had a lot of cool visuals. Lots of uh, 80s 3D wireframe stuff coming out of the screen and shooting lasers. This is another song where none of the actual words in the lyrics grabbed me as title material. So I I, I guess I just came up with Cabinet Man because it sounds kind of spooky. And also there's two other tracks with the word man in the title. And I guess that's just a subtle way of um, unifying. Uh, not really. What am I talking about? 
Well, this part sounds pretty cool, right? Uh, this was pretty high on my vocal register. I just kind of had to yell it and overlay multiple tracks to make it sound okay. It sounds okay. After I came up with the order for the songs on the album, I ended up having to go in and alter the intros and outros of the songs to make them fit together in a cool way. So like this song was done and it came in with the, the little soft strum guitar and I ended up isolating a synth from later in the song and putting it right at the beginning with some nice echoes to make it a more smooth transition into this song. And also to make sure that there's, you know, occasionally there's more than five seconds where I'm not singing in the album. So this song, I had this melody, which was always meant to sound very doo-wop inspired and kind of sad. But uh, when I realized that I don't have the vocal chops of old doo-wop singers, I somehow got the idea to just cheat with vocoder effects. So I have my actual voice on the lead vocals, uh, plus like four or five backup vocals put through vocoders. Uh, and you know, like these are plug-in vocoders, not actual physical devices that I own. Um, so there's those tracks plus all these uh, synthesizer tracks that are pushing the melodies through onto those vocals. And if I took those synths out, there could be a version of this song with all natural voices, but it would sound awful because I wasn't very concerned with hitting the right notes. The synths uh, were doing that work. The lyrics are another hypothetical sci-fi short story, just an interdimensional love story with really bad repercussions. Uh, the sort of thing that people were worried the Large Hadron Collider would unleash on the world. This all blossomed from the title, which is just a dumb pun on Brown Eyed Girl. You know, just like the weirdness of eye color in love songs. Because eyes are these amazing windows to the soul that we fall in love with and we put them on a pedestal, but they're really just another body part at the end of the day. I don't know. I like eyes and all, but they're just the window to the eyes. Earlier on, I had more realistic sounding drums on this version of the song, but for some reason they just weren't sounding right. And I don't know why I decided to add kind of uh, these early 90s sampled uh, like New Jack Swing big drums, but I think it worked. Recording really quiet parts with vocals is tough because I have never had any kind of isolated sound booths. I've never even tried, really. Sometimes I'll throw a blanket over my computer. So recording something like that was kind of tough. I'd have to get pretty close to the mic and uh, cut off any room noise at the end of a word, stuff like that. And this breakdown section was kind of an interesting thing to, to produce because I guess I just started with just the, the synths playing kind of like, you know, solid tones with uh, no real volume variation. And then I sat down with a microphone and basically just recorded myself humming into the microphone to add some intonation to those synths. So for like the bass, I wouldn't be worrying about the, the note, I'd just be going bum. Wow. And then, you know, once I put it all together, you know, I had the right notes and the right volumes and it all sounded pretty cool. I guess this one has a happy ending, sorta. I guess a romance. My favorite vocal track happens during this part and it's when it's like half faded out, but it's the, uh, this part, the whoa, whoa, whoa harmony. That's me acknowledging that adding a ton of reverb smooths things out. And uh, to transition into When He Died, which is more of an explicitly horror-themed song, I recorded these janky synths to an actual cassette tape, and I played them back through this uh, vintage Radio Shack battery-operated cassette player. And if you pick it up and you shake it, it sounds very warbly and very spooky. I highly recommend listening to all music in this way. So this is another kind of doo-wop with a weird twist type of song. It uses that classic four chord 50s progression, I believe it's called. 
Uh, but it switches between Lydian and diatonic scales for you know the first two and the last two chords of that progression. And what that means is there's literally like one note that is off from what you'd expect from this kind of song. Uh, you can't hear it in my vocals, but it, it's in like uh, some of the backup instruments and the uh, guitar solo that comes later. Everyone always compares this glockenspiel part to the theme from Rugrats, and I disagree. It's clearly supposed to evoke Take Me There by Blackstreet. Totally different song. You can hear some flourishes from this janky little toy wooden harp that's uh, like tuned beyond saving. Uh, you can hear it in its full glory whenever Snape appears in the Potter Puppet Pals Halloween special that I made some years back. I definitely have a habit of finding and collecting weird little instruments like that and forgetting to use them or just not finding a place to use them. So I was, I'm glad, you know, when I can use a messed up harp in a song. <laughs> Key change chorus, that's a cheap but effective trick in songwriting. I really like the pitched up la la la's in the right channel. They sound like cartoon cats. Does anyone remember like statues that cried blood? That was a thing. I think I probably saw it on, on an episode of Sightings, maybe on the sci-fi channel. When I was working on this song, uh, They Might Be Giants came out with a song called When Will You Die? And I was briefly worried that they would be too similar, but thankfully they're very different. But I do highly recommend that song for the record. It's a good one. Yeah, that harp is now replaced by a harmonica because that's another instrument I just had laying around and I didn't really know how to play it correctly. So I just wanted to get it in there justify owning a harmonica. So the Oka laughing record was a 1920s novelty record that was just some people laughing together. It, the idea was that laughter is infectious, so this record should sell like hotcakes, and it did. It was a huge hit. But when I listened to it, I thought it was the scariest thing I've ever heard. And it's public domain, so I got to scratch my sampling itch on this album. By the way, if you have the vinyl version of this album, uh, I definitely recommend uh, after the third side is done playing, just let it keep playing. And there should be a little surprise there in the center of the disc. And by the way, people seem to have trouble interpreting this song, but it's really, it's just a litany of creepy, mysterious things being discovered about someone who's died. You hear about stuff like this every now and then, but I like that this one guy really outdid everyone, and he made sure to leave a real mystery behind. So that's the concept of the song. It's just a guy whose death raised far, far, far more questions than it could ever answer. Oh, I really hit that note there. I'm pretty happy with my vocals on this track. I, I feel like the melody of this song was like pretty up and down, probably one of the harder ones to do. Uh, that being said, you know, there's a lot of little notes that I would love to go in and do better, or they just sound off now. But I guess that means I'm improving, that I can hear those imperfections. I know when I was younger, I couldn't. I didn't think I was good, but I just couldn't tell when I was specifically really bad. And if you listen closely, there's like a little heartbeat kick drum here. So this is Sweet Bod. Uh, it's weird subject matter, even for me. I had to run this song by my loved ones and I got a lot of, uh, I don't know, man, responses. Uh, but it's inspired by the Mellified Man, a legend that spans multiple cultures, but it probably never happened. Uh, wherein an old guy would willingly eat nothing but honey until he died so that he could be buried in a coffin full of yet more honey. And after 100 years, he would just kind of turn into a confection with incredible healing properties. It's sort of like being an organ donor. It's a nice thought anyway. But my idea was, 
how do you pitch that to someone? Like, hey, uh, so I have this theory. Do you like honey? Somehow this lyrical concept that I had got paired with a jam that I was working on. And something about setting it to music just made it uh, take on an unintentionally perverse tone. So instead of scrapping the song, I thought, well, what if the singer just tries to clarify that it's not a sex thing? But like, good God, that only makes it worse. I guess that's probably why it's only a legend and it never actually really happened, was it just skewed people out too much. Uh, but in the end, I liked having a funk song that required too much explanation and defensiveness. Because I think singing about someone else's body is weird and commodifying as it is. So it was a natural fit, I thought. Uh, one of the bonus tracks is a demo for this song, and it's uh, just an earlier version with the same lyrics but a harder synth sound. And it was just too fast and hard to listen to. I like the big synth breakdown in the middle of it, but that just didn't translate to the new funk direction, so it's pretty different. And to go back even further, before it had any music, the lyrics were originally... They tied into the Boston Molasses Flood of 1919, which actually killed a bunch of people. And the premise would have been about how on the 100 year anniversary of that, these jars of sweet liquid cure-all would start turning up, being sold on the streets of Boston. But, you know, real people died in that tragedy, and I felt like the uh, one, uh, one weird legend was enough for a song. And the guitar solo here is the only guest spot on the album, and it's Dave Kitzberg, a really gifted player who's he's done live shows with me, and I've got that same bit speak plug-in running on the guitar and a few of the other synths in this song. My overall direction was to try and make it sound like there was a real vintage funk song uh, kind of buried under a bunch of more modern and unique sounds. And some of the backup vocals are pitched up a bit to sound like I have both male and female singers. But nope, it's just me. And yes, I finally got to use the word panacea in a song. And those high-pitched cowbells, which I've always loved. I love that kind of shit, like those little, uh, those little tiny tom drums. That stuff's good. And there's some, uh, like, chopping up of the song here that I added, pretty much at the last minute, like, in the mixing, mastering stage. Sweet mod! So this is Eighth Wonder. This is the oldest track on the album. It was originally released in 2009, but it's held up pretty well, and it fits the spirit phone theme and it never got a, an official release so into the album it went and I didn't really change much about it uh, I added like a little bit of flanger to this intro and you know tweaked the EQ and mixing and all that stuff but pretty much the same track I released back in 2009 there was actually this extended like fiddle solo uh, outro that I chopped off, at least for the music video, which is how most people heard it. So that part's kind of uh, discontinued, I guess. But uh, most of the lyrics come from quotes from this old ghost story or poltergeist, maybe, or just a talking animal. Uh, it was reported by a young girl and her family on the Isle of Man in, I think, the 1930s. Uh, so look up Jeff the Mongoose, G-E-F. This story stuck out to me because he's so childish and quotable and talkative for a ghost. He's cracking jokes and he's insulting people and making outlandish claims, but he's totally hidden and nobody can really see him. They, they catch glimpses of a mongoose sometimes, but they don't really see this talking character. And if you read some of the original reporting on him, he has such a memorable presence without ever coming out into the open. 
He's just a voice in the wall. I fell in love with the story because, well, like a lot of paranormal stories and ghost stories, the people involved swear up and down pretty convincingly that it really happened. But what makes it different is it's the kind of story that a little kid would tell, not understanding that it's not a believable lie. But it's told in a believable way. So it has the effect of not just challenging what you think the rules of the universe are, but challenging that there are any rules. So letting yourself get drawn into the story is, in a way, creepier than a story that is more quote-unquote plausible. Got some real bass in this song, which I don't often do. I remember recording this in the basement of my family's house. It was probably one of the last songs I made there before I moved to the city. And I shot the music video in my family's yard in the woods that I grew up near and this old shack that's on our property line. So this song has a real end of an era feeling for me. I think I made this song around the same time as Redesign Your Logo. And they're both the start of a lot of samples and sounds that I continued to use up until today, really. The, uh, the drum sounds, the strings, the imitation analog synths, as well as trying a little bit harder on my vocals. So it's like I tapped into something pretty good with this song. It just ended up sounding a lot better than anything else I was doing at the, at the time. And I'm realizing now that if I hadn't made this song, or if it had just turned out totally differently, there are a lot of things I wouldn't have even tried in music for the next few years. Uh, because it was just a confidence booster to have accidentally made a song that sounds like a real song. So that's Eighth Wonder. This ending was a new composition for the album. It took a lot of effort not to make it its own track. I went overboard with splitting my last album, View Monster, into like 32 different tracks, including all the transitions, so... I really had to keep myself in check this time. No superfluous concept tracks or anything. And I wrote this little melody just to modulate the last song's ending chord into something that matches the, uh, the next song's intro chord. But it actually ended up being one of my uh, favorite moments on the album. It sounds kind of like a creepy soft lullaby with a vacuum going in the other room. This intro part is me playing the organ patch on an old Casio keyboard that I found at a thrift store and singing along. I added like one extra vocal track, but the first vocal and the organ are performed together in one recording, which isn't that interesting, but it's just something I don't usually do. I don't usually sing and play an instrument at the same time. I think recording just by myself at home with uh, no need to book studio time is totally a double-edged sword because on one hand I end up dragging out the process of making a song for way way too long and I haven't honed the skills of uh, just getting in there and recording what you need to do and then getting out but on the other hand it's a lot more flexible and creative ideas don't have to stop just because I'm in the middle of recording I can always just stop singing and go back to work on the instruments or add more tracks and develop a harmony or something that would be impossible or just a big headache if you were booking studio time or working with someone else and having to respect their schedule. This song is a good example of one that went through a lot of revisions and rethinkings and originally it was a really relentless, you know, constant drum beat kind of song. And I did stuff like I added this no stars part. It's an extra two beats that weren't there originally. And I I stripped it down mostly to just kick and snare in the drums. And I tried to add more stop and go and variation in the song. And you'll notice that's a recurring theme with uh, the edits that I ended up making to these songs. And even still, the, one of the main criticisms I get for this album is that it just has too much energy that lasts for way too long. Which, okay, just, you know, don't listen to it all at once, I guess. And man, I can't 
can't believe I, uh, I did these falsetto notes here. It sounds okay, though. Um, so this song is from the point of view of a caveman uh, who's meeting an alien, and he just knows that it's wrong, and he can't deal with it. And I guess the alien is stranded or in need of help in some way, and the caveman just refuses to help because he gets a primal reaction from meeting someone not of the Earth. Of course, in reality, cave people were probably freaked out all the time by totally natural things, too. I like the random square notes that are playing in this part. Almost all of the synths in my songs these days are from a plugin called Synth One, which is very popular and free. And it's just a good all around synth. It can do a little bit of everything. And I'm happy to say that finally, I pretty much know what all the knobs do. And I can make my own custom patches or emulate synths I've heard in other songs. And when I was younger, that stuff was just black magic to me and I had no idea how any of it did and it looked suspiciously like math, so I didn't really try. One thing I really miss is uh, my parents had this really old early 80s monophonic synthesizer and I used to plug it in and mess with it and have no idea what I was doing, but there's something really satisfying about physically turning a knob and seeing a light blink faster or slower and hearing the sound transform but it would drive me nuts to actually have to record like that because I always want to tweak everything at every stage of production. And having to decide how something's going to sound and then record it and then be stuck with that is not my idea of a good time. Case in point, I got another one of these swirly synthy outros going here, and the synthesizer here required a lot of finagling and going back and forth and making it softer. We're adding more of a gliding portamento between the notes. And there's three different synthesizers playing right now, and they all needed that kind of flexibility to get this sound. This song is called Soft Fuzzy Man, and um, that's something that uh, me and my wife now call our cat. Originally, the opening line was, Hello, Sally. Hello, Susie. Let me float your way and introduce me. Which was probably too awkward and tortured a rhyme even for me. Uh, an early, early version of this song also had the Don't Worry Bill Murray rhyme couplet that I used on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 Pokemon, I think in like 2008. I think that was just temporary lyrics that I ended up recycling. But yeah, that means that the melody and bass line for this are even older than 2008. It might have been like Dinosaur Orchestra era, like 2006 or something. Uh, this is me playing guitar badly, but I'm using that Bitspeak plugin again. It's very unique sounding. It's kind of like a kazoo. The song is about a cloud man or a ghost or maybe just a metaphor for someone who thinks that being a total mystery makes him attractive. And I do the thing where I, that I usually do, where I figure out an underlying metaphor, and that's good enough. Uh, now I can move on and just have fun with the literal side of the lyrics. So there's something about male unrelatability in there, but mostly it's just a cloud man song. The drums in this part of the song are just a bunch of really compressed, uh, like claps and cowbells that are being wildly tuned up and down. I always feel like the bridge is a good place to attempt to humanize a weird character that I'm singing about. Like, yeah, jokes, 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 but no, I'm serious. Okay, back to jokes. I think rhyming the word nervous with surface is within the acceptable range of rhymes. In an early version of this, I had the line change each time, so I'd say, what you girls really need is a nebulous man or a fragmental man. And I kind of miss those lines because fragmental is a good word. It makes you see spots was a line change. I had something about seeping through the vents before. Either way, he's some sort of poisonous gas, maybe. 
I think I specified that he's hitting on a whole group of women at once to try and undercut the creepiness of this noxious, pervasive character. That's still the point, but at least he's outnumbered. Final thing I did was this little vocal thing here. Reminds me of Cornelius. As your father, I expressly forbid it. I liked doing such a simple bass and guitar riff. Uh, there's still some good chord changes in the song, but they're all lumped together in one part of the verse. And then it comes back to that riff or, you know, the chorus just louder. It's actually so simple. I am really curious if this dun 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 thing has been done before. If anyone has uh, found a prior use, please let me know. This is yet another unpleasant character, but uh, I liked doing this uh, cartoonish strict dad because it let me yell most of the lyrics instead of sing. Because all I really wanted to do was say things like, don't talk about the internet in an unhinged manner. So this title is in the present tense. And I went back and forth a couple times thinking like, uh, am I using the word expressly correctly? Does it matter? It just feels like something that you've heard a dad say in a movie at some point, but I don't think it is. It made me think of King Triton from The Little Mermaid, and I'll talk about him in a second. I just want to say that I really like my dad, and we get along very well, and he was never ever like the dad in this song. This nightmare dad is just a character, and I also, I think, would try very hard not to be this dad. The lack of trust and friendship on display here is very sad. He does apologize for yelling, but he's just yelling for the whole song, and then he threatens to yell some more. I think this dad only has this one move. Or maybe he doesn't even really yell at his kid, and this song is just like an internal monologue, and he has to lock himself in his bedroom and just scream it out with his guitar. It's a better idea. So this breakdown was originally going to be me quoting King Triton's various scoldings of Ariel, and I guess it was too weird. So I turned those lines into a bass solo, so they're still there in a way. He's a human. You're a mermaid. I did this song live and I used a backing video that was just a really cheap slideshow of every pop culture dad I could think of. So it was like Archie Bunker and Nigel Thornberry and Goofy and uh, Jack Torrance and um, Major Dad, Papa Smurf. And I made sure to get my own dad in there too. But yeah, this is the ultimate anthem for dads and they should play it uh, for father-daughter dances at weddings instead of that fucking John Mayer song. This effect is called a ring modulator and I'm applying it to the synth that runs through the song here. There's this sort of gritty sine wave playing randomized notes throughout the song, and whenever the guitar is strummed, it fades out for a second. That's called side chain compression, folks. This is Iron My Life, by the way. It's a rare song uh, that had lyrics that were written before the music. And, I mean, that's not rare, but for me it is. And it was always supposed to come right after As Your Father. I think the song was born in the lyrics text file for that song. And it was always going to be a more intimate take on the same overkill dad. It's all the mantras he repeats to himself to remind himself why he's such an asshole. He doesn't know how not to be afraid, so he channels it into unpleasant behavior and decides it's a virtue. So there's a sympathetic guy here, but he's buried under some really difficult layers. These songs are not inspired by anyone that I really know. They're just imagining someone who's ruled by emotions that everyone gets to some degree, but which seem to be amplified sometimes by parenthood. And then you just got your classic death stuff here. And it's funny because characters in songs should not be worried about death. I should, you should, but fictional characters need to lighten up a little bit. Cool thing about this song is there's only like two words that rhyme with life and everyone knows that so they're willing to cut me some slack if I want to rhyme it with something like survive. 
This uh, flute solo is actually like a grade school recorder, and I recorded it in little bits, and I spliced them all together. So if you had a mental image of me like totally jamming away on a flute, yeah, that's a false image, sorry. What you want to imagine is me sitting in a chair with a wooden recorder, hitting R on my keyboard, playing two notes, hitting space bar, rewinding a couple seconds, listening to it, hitting control Z because it didn't sound good, recording it again, then moving on to the next two notes. What I do is very glamorous, extremely rock and roll. Despite this being the most serious track on the album, I guess, it's still, musically, it's like a total grab bag. I got like 8-bit percussion and organs and horns and all sorts of craziness. This could totally be another song about crayons if I wanted to, but why can't we throw a party in honor of the crushing weight of responsibility? Making this music involves a lot of sitting on my butt, not interacting with other people, and I overcompensate for that, and I'm okay with this, by making every song danceable on some level. This song is called Reaganomics. This is Ronald Reagan speaking. I took one of his famous quotes and I edited it to be more nonsensical. Although it was pretty nonsensical to start with. This is a trick that I really should do more often where it's, you have a, a, a different part at the beginning that comes back later as the bridge. I always feel a sense of intent when that happens. So this song is mostly in 6-4 time, which is not the weirdest time signature, but for some reason it's not very common. The vast majority of pop music is in 4-4, and whenever someone wants to be different or difficult, they usually pick a weird, odd, numbered time signature. The problem with doing that is the inevitable. This sounds like Rush comments. Uh, but 6-4 feels natural to me. It's four beats, then two beats, and repeat. And speaking of being difficult, this song has uh, backup vocals that are singing different lines over the main vocals. So if you want to sing along, you really have to pick one or the other. And then the chorus is back to 4-4 four, four time. This was definitely one of those songs where I was thinking of an interesting sounding word, Reaganomics. And I checked to see if any other songs had been written with that as the title, and I saw that it was up for grabs, and I just went for it. Uh, there is a band by that name who do 80s covers, but I figured that was different enough. Uh, but actually, I was wrong. There was another song, at least one other song, called Reaganomics, and it's from the year 1985 by DRI, a thrash metal band. And it's 42 seconds long. I just listened to it, and the lyrics are just... Reaganomics killing me, Reaganomics killing you. I have to hand it to those boys, their song is more to the point than mine. I consider Reagan a pretty bad president, though I wasn't conscious then. This was written before Trump, and I was fascinated that an actor became president, and that he was canonized, and everyone just takes it for granted now. Of course, he did serve as a governor, and it doesn't seem as crazy now, but I was looking at all these old pictures of Reagan dressed all slickly in his suits, and I felt that uh, amping up the superficial charm to sell people on something that doesn't really make sense works all too well in a pop song. You just have to say baby a lot and make endless promises because the song ends in three minutes. And it was astounding to me to realize how stepping into the role of a snake oil salesman bent on deceiving the listener, how easy that made it to write a passable pop song. And now anytime I hear a song where some guy is reaching out his hand and asking you to trust him with your heart, I just wonder what scam he's running. You know, like that song Magic Carpet Ride, I'm thinking Steppenwolf doesn't really have a magic carpet. And you know, Kokomo is not a real place, so... What are the Beach Boys trying to pull? Is it a tax thing? You can hear a bit of that white noise here. I don't know what it is. 
maybe it's still a ghost. So there's a lot of 80s influence on this album, but I put this and Reaganomics together because they share a certain power suit megalomania quality. And I liked that I managed to make this sound like music from a deteriorating corporate training tape. It's like kind of optimistic, but in a cold survival of the fittest kind of way. This melody and chord progression were something that I used to just play on the piano all the time. There are tunes that develop from just humming a melody or placing notes manually with the mouse cursor. And there are songs that I play on the piano that won't get recorded at all for years. They just kind of live within that piano realm. I really hit the top of my vocal range in, in this song, but I had no choice because sometimes music just sounds right and transposing it down or up to accommodate my vocal range messes with it. Suddenly I've got notes that just are too low and they don't sound good. And I've already got the melody planned out and I'm not going to change the notes just because I can barely hit them. So I just kind of forge ahead and if I can't hit the note, then try again tomorrow. And very gradually over the years, I have actually been able to extend my upper range a little bit. It doesn't always sound great, but I can do it. This song makes me think of uh, if Bruce Wayne's parents never died and he didn't care about crime, but he still had all that dark energy in him. He would just spend all night staring out the window, envisioning skyscrapers he could be building. I'm glad I put some special synths from my childhood here. Uh, you can hear some MS-DOS style ad-lib instruments mixed in. This would be a good song to put on while you're playing Sim Tower, I think. Or if you're playing Sim Ant, you can play the next track. A lot of my songs are inspired by Wikipedia articles. Uh, I'll just go down a Wikipedia hole and find something that makes me want to write a song about it. And this one was a page called List of Visionary Tall Buildings and Structures. And it's just a list arranged by height of hypothetical or planned or designed but possibly unbuildable um, mega structures. A lot of them are like these insanely huge pyramids that like a million people could live in and they're all way 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 taller than the actual tallest building that exists so those always make me think about how incredible or incredibly dangerous it would be if one of them actually existed and the phrase man-made object is a qualifier that i sometimes have to put in when i'm wondering what's the oldest thing what's the biggest thing when really the question i'm asking is what's the biggest thing that we have done as a species? And for something to hold that kind of record, someone needs to have envisioned it that way. This is just my voice and the bell digitally stretched out. And actually, I just realized that I used a really similar sounding bell at the end of the last track as the uh, intro of this one. That was unintentional. One of the last things I added to this track was these uh, old stock uh, thunder sound effects. I guess they punctuate the secondary metaphor of this song of um, weather and hurricanes, but mostly I just I liked how they sounded. The uh, chord progression for this song actually comes from a, like an instrumental track that I made years ago that also had the chords for uh, No-Eyed Girl kind of as part of the same song, and they ended up getting split into two different tracks years later. And I think I posted that a while ago on Twitter, if you're trying to find it. I think the high tinkly piano here is probably inspired by the um, original Sesame Street theme. I always liked how that sounded. You can't play the top of the piano and take yourself too seriously. That's the baby part of the piano. So ant mills, or ant death spirals, are this phenomenon where ants get into a feedback loop with each other's pheromones, and they start walking around in a circle or a spiral, 
endlessly until they all die of exhaustion. I knew this um, would be a potent metaphor, and all I had to do was like carefully write around it without uh, giving up that I don't know what I'm doing. I can tell you some things about bugs, and if you like the music and have an imagination, hopefully it will become a meaningful song on delivery. Or if you're like me, you just listen to songs without consciously parsing the lyrics, sort of in one ear and out the other, and the vocals are just another instrument. That's how I listen to music. I go years without realizing what a song is actually about. And I'd have a much easier time writing songs if everyone were like that. But some of you are those maniacs who instantly focus in on understanding the lyrics and you know right away if it's a good song or just a good uh, sounding song. And I live in fear of you people. Please just let me sing about bugs. Bugs that don't matter. That's all I want to do. I mean, it's very satisfying to successfully make a song that feels a little more substantial through the use of words and, you know, emotionally evocative singing. It just takes way longer to do that. Anyway, this is the last track on Spirit Phone, the proper album. There's a bunch of bonus tracks that uh, I don't have a ton to talk about them, so I'm just going to summarize them real quickly. Starting now. <clears throat> Crisis Actors is about the shitty, shitty theory that Alex Jones types put forth that victims of certain politically inconvenient tragedies are just paid actors and the whole thing's a sham to pushed public opinion or whatever. This track was almost a proper track on Spirit Phone, but I was running out of room. It also quotes the cool banner that lands on the T-Rex at the end of Jurassic Park. Redesign Your Logo is an older song full of meaningless six-syllable phrases evoking bunk marketing jargon. There was a PDF file floating around Describing the total moon logic that was justifying Pepsi's logo redesign, it may have been a hoax document, but either way, some firm got paid a ton of money for that awful logo. You know the one. Pizza Heroes. My sister Emmy was kicking around this idea for a cartoon about pizza delivery team who uh, could travel extremely fast to anywhere in the world, so I wrote this for that hypothetical cartoon. Your At The Party is a track that I never quite finished to my liking. It's about a sick person who's trying to sleep while a noisy party happens next door, and it gradually overtakes him and invades his nightmares. Or are they nightmares? I don't know, it's ambiguous. Angry People is this intense, uh, techno song about how, I guess, hate sex leads to evil babies, and everyone's angry and trying to lead normal lives without ever not being angry, and then they turn into wolves and tigers and stuff. Geocities is, and uh, Angel Fire are two instrumental songs, they're just fun. GeoCities has an edited sample at the end of The Voter, an early speech synthesis, speech synthesis machine that uh, kind of worked like a reverse stenography keyboard. Gravitron is a demo I wrote as an ultimately unused theme song for the show Gravity Falls. Back when its creator Alex Hirsch was preparing his pitch, I wasn't sure what the vibe of the show was going to be exactly, so I wrote a couple themes covering the spectrum. This is the one that I wrote inspired by the creepy, weird, vintage inspiration material that he had collected. Uh, the other theme I wrote had lyrics, and it's not a bonus track on this album, but Moon's Request is a remix of one line that I sung from that, ver from that, uh, that song. And I remember making this remix to try and uh, break my uh, writer's block while coming up with themes for this show. Uh, the Sweet Bod demo, I talked about that already. Cat Hacks is a crazy sounding instrumental. It was supposed to have lyrics, sort of, uh, just a list of hacks for your cat, such as tape a marker to your cat, DIY GPS tracker, stack multiple cats for that extra vertical cat value, make a sincere attempt for once in your life at empathizing with other people and your cat. Cabinet Man demo, I talked a little bit about that already. Kubrick and the Beast was supposed to be the opening track for spirit phone at one point, but the album's tone ended up going in another direction, and I had to break it to myself gently. And that's ultimately what this album was about. I think it's got a certain tone, despite using multiple genres, but these songs were written separately over multiple years, spanning a lot of changes in my life, and with that in mind, of course there's no singular theme that ties them all together. But I did luck out, and they all kind of fit within three or four categories, I guess. 
and they gel in a way that hopefully kind of justifies it being such a long album. And if you're listening to this, I guess you liked it enough to listen to me talk about it for this long. And I'm extremely lucky and grateful that there are people like you who listened to this album and actually felt something. Even after putting out music for two thirds of my life, that's still a really magical feeling. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>